here we are in 2022 at a crossroads. Already this year, it feels familiar to 2020. We've got the Omicron. I think I read this morning, the Delta Cron is coming. Uh, some kind of transformer. Uh, it's a joke. Uh, we've got the flu Rona. Uh, you know, we, we've got all sorts of things. Uh, as I travel, I'm seeing more fear. I'm seeing more churches fold around the nation. I'm seeing lots of sickness and there's a great uncertainty. And so I believe that we're at a crossroads in America. We're at a crossroads in the church. We're in a crisis. And I want to point it out to you today from a biblical perspective, but I also want to direct your attention uh, to a recent uh, article that came out at the end of last year. If you guys could put that on the screen uh, just to show you. So this is from the Christian Post. Most adult U.S. Christians do not believe the Holy Spirit is real. This is not the New York Post. This is not the Washington Times. This is one of the leading Christian magazine websites in the world having done a survey in the church. I said that we're in a crisis. I said that we're at a crossroads. There is tension being released in the earth and you're going to see many fold and then you're going to see a remnant emerge. What we saw this morning is a preview of what's coming. We're gonna have to begin to create atmospheres of encounter where people can really begin to experience the presence and power of God, especially Gen Z, millennials, those who are up and coming. God is dealing a decisive blow to the spirit of religion. When we read here in Acts chapter 3, we're going to see a collision between revival and religion. We are seeing a divine confrontation happen in America. Those who want to continue to try to go back to business as usual. People are just waiting for things to pass. And we are going to continue to see birth pangs and tremors and shakings. The Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. I believe that we have entered a new era in the earth where what we once did will no longer work. From the Christian Newspaper, most U.S. Christians don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Let me read you two paragraphs quickly from the study. This study shows in general that while a majority of America's self-identified Christians, including many who identify as Pentecostal, believe that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and is the creator of the universe, more than half reject a number of biblical teachings and principles, including the existence of the Holy Spirit. Some 62% of self-identified born-again Christians contend that the Holy Spirit is not a real living being, but merely a symbol of God's power presence, or purity. Some 62% of self-identified, born-again, Pentecostal people do not actually believe in the power and presence of God. I tell you today at the start of 2022, God is searching the earth 
for lighthouse churches. He is searching the earth looking for men and women who are not only ashamed of the who are not only not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but who are not ashamed to step out and demonstrate the kingdom of God to the world around them. What what a confirmation today at 9 a.m that God clearly has his own agenda. God clearly has his own plans. And he is looking for a people who are willing to be flexible, who are willing to get a little uncomfortable. Maybe another way to put it is to touch on the entertainment spirit that's come to America. Any Francis Chan fans? Love Francis Chan, a wonderful reformer in the body of Christ. Listen to what he says. The benchmark of success in church services has become more about attendance than the movement of the Holy Spirit. The entertainment model of church was largely adopted in the 1980s and 90s. And while it alleviated boredom for a few hours a week, it filled our churches with self-focused consumers rather than self-sacrificing servants of Jesus Christ. The days are over of checking off religious boxes, saying I went to church on Sunday, and then ignoring the promptings of the Holy Spirit at work, at the gas station, in the grocery store. Folks, we need people committed to target elementary schools and middle schools and high schools, not with violence, but with spiritual violence. We need moms and dads committed to wholehearted obedience to Jesus Christ to make war on the Antichrist. Is anybody awake this morning? To make war on the Antichrist agenda that is raging in our school systems. It is time to sound an alarm in 2022. It is time to blow a trumpet in Zion. It is time to get in revival. It is time to find your heart burning with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Spectator religious Christianity, fence riding, one foot in compromise, one foot in the church will no longer do with the shaking and the tremors. You were born for such a time as this. God could have chosen to put breath in your lungs in any generation, but he has anointed you. He has appointed you for such a time as this. I wish I was in a black church this morning. They'd already be shouting me down. Don't worry, I'm used to it. I call it the Midwest malaise. How many of you are grateful for Jesus this morning? So grateful. So grateful that he set me free. So grateful that he delivered me from darkness. So grateful that I was formerly a son of darkness, but now he has invited me into a marvelous light. I'm so grateful for a new nature, that the power of the sin nature has been broken off of my life. I'm so grateful that I get to serve Jesus in humility. I'm so grateful for the joy of the Holy Spirit, that I don't have to be another miserable Christian in America that fills a pew every Sunday, wondering what I'm missing out on out there when days of revival are coming to the church where people out there are going to wonder what they're missing out on in here. (laughs) All right, Acts 3. Are you ready? 
Are you ready to rumble? Hallelujah. We love the word of God. Holy Spirit, come and search us and know us. Come and reveal sin in our hearts, apathy, lethargy, complacency. Lord, I thank you that you're coming this year to Lima, Ohio to raise the standard. Lord, I thank you that you're coming to break protocol. Lord, we value your presence and your power. Lord, we push back on the agenda of the age. Lord, we welcome you here in this place. Lord, we ask for radical conversions. Lord, we ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for a harvest of souls in this region. God, I ask that you would raise up messengers in every sphere of society in this region. Lord, raise up burning and shining lamps. Lord, we ask for a spirit of burning today. Lord, we ask, Lord, for a spirit of revival today. Lord, come and revive your people with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. When Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, a certain man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the temple gate. Can you say every day? The temple gate was called beautiful. Scholars say it was probably the double gate. It was set there in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. And Peter, along with John, fixed their gaze upon him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. And with a leap he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and were praising God. And they were taking note as him who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And then I just want to point your attention to Acts chapter 4 verse 22. When Peter and John are brought before the the board or the Sanhedrin. And in verse 22, Acts 4.22, it specifically says that this crippled, lame man, this beggar, was more than 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. I want to break this story down for us historically. Is that okay? I put about 40 hours of study into these seven verses, and I'm going to try to give it to you in about 15 minutes. Is that a good deal? You just sit there, clap. If you feel like, you know, saying amen, you can. Okay, so let's break this down. If you're taking notes, let's look at this temple gate called beautiful. Hopefully, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we can bring it home. The temple gate called beautiful, we know that there were nine gates that surrounded the city. The temple gate, or we know it was the double gate, was one of nine gates. We know that the double gate faced the east, and at this particular gate, only certain individuals could walk through it because it led to several important things. Now, the temple gate called Beautiful, as you entered it, it led to the court of the women, 
where women and children could only enter through the double gate. Behind the beautiful gate were 13 trumpet-shaped boxes where people would give their tithes and offerings at the temple. And behind the beautiful gate, there were steps where the Levites chanted. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that this lame, crippled beggar was strategically positioned. They set this man at a gate that had a high traffic. It was very important. People that would walk through there, what happened beyond that gate, very important. Are you tracking with me so far? The temple gate called beautiful, not just any gate, specifically the court of the women. Women and children would walk through it. People would go and present tithes and offerings at the temple through this gate. The Levites would chant beyond this gate, heavy religious activity. Now let me draw your attention to some stories about Jesus. Do you guys remember when Simeon and Anna met Jesus in the temple. Anna had prayed her entire life for Messiah, finally meets him. What gate would Jesus' family had to walk through to get to Simeon and Anna? They would have had to go through the beautiful gate. You remember when... Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, they leave Jerusalem thinking that Jesus is with them and he's not. Where do they find him? In the temple. The only gate that he could have got through to get to the temple was the temple gate called Beautiful. What about when Jesus would walk in and throw out the money changers? He would have walked through the temple gate called Beautiful. Jesus cleansed the temple to start his ministry, and he cleansed the temple to begin his ministry. What about all the time that they went to pray at the temple. They would have walked through the temple gate called Beautiful because Mary Magdalene and the mother of Jesus and women would have been in their entourage. So now that we're beginning to put some missing pieces together, this lame, crippled beggar represents religion. The spirit of religion comes to tame you. The spirit of religion is based on what we can control because we have to have things predictable. This lame, crippled beggar was sat down, carried at the temple every single day, going through the motions. He had a script that he followed. There are individuals in the church in this hour that like the lame, crippled beggar, you have been crippled by religion. You are going through the motions. You have experienced everything that the church has to offer. I say it like this. I have a brother, my younger brother right under me. He's in a federal prison right now serving a long-term sentence. How did I become a preacher and he become a long-term prisoner? Prisoner. We both knew the scriptures, and we both sang the songs, but only one of us had an encounter. See, experiential knowledge is transformational knowledge. I'm talking about moving beyond the religious, knowing about God, to actually knowing God in an experiential way so that when temptation comes knocking at your door, just knowing that sex before marriage is wrong isn't going to keep you a virgin. 
just knowing you're not supposed to get drunk, just knowing about bad things. See, this is my passion for young people in this generation. This is my passion beyond rules and regulations as parents, making them do what you want them to do. Folks, if our kids don't come into encounter, if they don't begin to experience the real presence and power of Jesus, we raise them in church, but have you raised them in Christ Jesus? So when we raise them in church, they hit 18 and while out. But I took them to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. I weep with these people in altars all over America. Raise their kids in church every week, every day. Check religious boxes. We're at a crossroads in America. The newspaper articles are in our face. Half of even Pentecostals deny the power and presence of the Lord. My question today to this church is what are you going to do about it? Are you a part of the majority that just has the lingo Or are you a part of the remnant that God is seeking in this nation who are going to go beyond church religious activity? There are people in this room today, see, a lot of you have a wild testimony. How many of you could say, I was a really good sinner? You meet people in the church all the time. I mean, you hear their story. They don't remember who they slept with, who they, how much they drank, how many drugs that they did. I mean, I call them wild ones. They wildly serve the devil. Here's the crazy thing. They're the quietest people in church. I'll say it another way that's more offensive. Why is it that in the church today, we are full of people who serve the devil way better than you've ever served God. See, back in the day, it didn't matter. We, you got dressed at midnight, went to the club at 3 in the morning, showed up at 6 a.m., Who? Again, you didn't care. Who knows? You woke up next to whoever. You got home whenever. But we've got to be out of church at a certain time or I'm bored. Well, brother, I have ADD. I can only pay attention to a 20-minute sermon, says the guy who's still playing modern warfare eight hours a day. You're in the movies holding your pee because you're so into the movie eating popcorn and candy, but we're bored in the church and want to get out of here. It's called idolatry. We need to repent of our carnal. It's not a hang up. It's sin. Just call a spade a spade. Let's repent together. Let's set our course for 2022 revival or we bust let's host the presence of God in this city I don't want to be a social club I don't want to be just another church I want the presence and the power and the person of Jesus to be real in my marriage to be real in my family I want my kids and my grandkids to inherit All that Jesus died for. Are we still here? Do we take off? I just, I want the real thing. I hope hope that you're here for the real deal thing. I've been been blessed in my own life by people that made me really angry. 
They made me feel like I wasn't saved. Where I thought I was doing good in God. I thought I was on fire. And then I got around someone that was really on fire. I loved him and hated him. I've been asking the Lord for friends that are like sandpaper. I've been asking the Lord to put something in the heart of a generation looking to be married. Stop looking for someone that's going to make you happy. Pray for someone that's going to make you holy. Folks, hard times are upon us. There is a pressure being released in the earth. This is why our whole movement, our ministry is centered on the return of the Lord because we have to work back from there. We have to have a context and a perspective that we are in a late hour in the earth, that there's a harvest of souls all around us, but I tell you, there's a harvest of souls sitting in the church. They're warming pews every Sunday, going through the motions like the lame, crippled beggar. They are watching Jesus walk by them every day. So let's move forward. So the lame, crippled beggar represents a lame, crippled religious church that has been going through the motions their entire life. I reference scriptures of Jesus from the time that he was a baby. How old was the crippled beggar when he was healed? 40. How old was Jesus when he died? So we know just by simple math, that it is totally plausible that Jesus Christ the Nazarene would have walked by the lame, crippled beggar multiple times in his life. And here's what I want to tell you today. There's a generation that has experienced all that the church had to offer, but God is inviting them now to experience his power. Peter and John are coming to church. What do I mean by that? I believe that Peter represents faith and power, and I believe that John represents intimacy. I believe that God is sending Peter and John faith, power, and intimacy to the church in America. And today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, this is not going to be any other day. This is a look at me. Silver and gold have I none. I don't have the props. I don't have the protocol. I don't have the money. I don't have the programs. You know what we found out in the pandemic? People don't care. They don't care about the buildings. They don't care about good preaching. They want to know, is there anyone out there that's not full of fear? Is there anyone out there that's been delivered from the fear of death because I know where I'm going when I die? Is there is there anyone out there that can make sense of what in the world is happening in the earth? I'll tell you what's happening in the earth. We're in the last days, and God is preparing a bride for his son, Jesus. He's not coming back to ruin your party. He's coming back to start the real one. It's time to shift our gaze in this hour. It's time to go all in. It's time to move beyond experiencing all that the church has to offer religion and begin to get into a realm of revival like Peter and John who recognize, you know what, I don't have it all going on, but I've got my Jesus Come on, somebody wave at me. I, 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 I don't know how much I can offer my workmates. 
pray that this would encourage a father drunk on work. More jobs and more jobs and more time and more time and more than providing for your kids, what they really need is for you to be present. What, what, what kind of inheritance are we leaving our grandchildren? If I'm going to offer some, something to someone, I want to offer them my Jesus. Not out of my mind, though. Not out, not out of some... Even salvation, we offer it to people like a package deal. Salvation is an introduction to a person. His name is Jesus. But you can't give away what you don't have. Is there, is there something burning this morning? Is the word of God stirring something inside of you? Is there a holy frustration that's coming upon you? Is there, is there an opportunity for this church heading into 2022 to begin to say, Lord, we might be surrounded in a generation with a lame, crippled beggar church, but we're going to be like Peter and John. We're going to be full of faith. We're going to host the power of God. We're going to call people to intimacy, to return to their first love. We're going to call at 9 a.m. on January 9th. That was just a preview. That was a foretaste. That was a down payment of what God, you know what I loved about that? The preacher didn't interpret the tongues. Because one of the things that we need in this generation is we need men and women in every sphere of society who have a personal, active relationship with the Holy Spirit, who are God's sheep, who hear his voice, who make the kingdom of God known everywhere that they go. Amen. I don't want to be another statistic. I don't want to have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. I don't want to settle for shallow waters in 2022 when God is calling me into the deep end. I want to try to figure out a way to have presence nights at my house with my kids. Folks, we've got to stop blaming the church. We've got to stop blaming youth pastors for why we won't disciple our own kids. We've got to rip the feeding tube from you to this pulpit and get you to begin to eat on God for yourself. He wants to become the personal possession of every believer in Jesus Christ. He wants to raise up fathers who are going to become priests in their home, more than providers, prayer warriors, more than providers, people that are going to get the word down into this next generation. God wants to encourage moms in this room that you have a call, you have a destiny, you have a purpose. All right, let's bow our heads. I don't even know if we got off the ground, but you can come back tonight. I promise I'll be more rowdy. If you thought this was something, you haven't seen anything. Holy Spirit, thank you for this morning. God, you said that you would baptize your people with the Holy Spirit and fire. God, I'm asking that you would baptize this church and region with the Holy Spirit and fire. God, we ask that you would activate the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, you said in the last days you'd pour out your Spirit. Sons and daughters would prophesy Old men would dream dreams, even on your maid servants, even on women and young women, you'll pour out your spirit. 
God, we say do it. Maybe you're here this morning. During the pandemic, it's just, it's got religious. It's okay. We've got to get to these moments where we're like, Lord, I recognize there's more. I need your help. Jesus is saying this morning to us, look at me. I might not have what you're wanting, but I'm going to help you get up and walk. If you're feeling him knocking on the door, if there's something in you saying yes, Yes, I'm not going to settle in 2022. Yes, I know there's more. If you want to respond, I just want to ask you to stand. Respond to the invitation for more. Respond to him reaching out saying there's more. If you want to respond, just stand and lift up your hands. And I want you to open up your mouth. If you're here today and you say, Lord, I want what happened at 9 a.m. to just be a little preview of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's coming to this church. God, send your fire. Come on, pour it out, pour it out. Come on, open up your mouth. Just two minutes. Here we are, God. Here we are, God. Come like a fire. Come like the wind. Pour out your spirit upon us today. Raise up witnesses in the earth that will testify of the coming of your son. God, there's got to be more. More than church attendance. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that the message that you just received challenge you and encourage you. I do want to go into a time of prayer, but before I do that, I want to give you an opportunity to sow a one-time gift into our ministry. Uh, there's going to be a number pop up on your screen, a link in the comment section. Or if you're desiring to do something further, you know, so many people around the world desire to participate with the Alter Global Movement. We'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. That link is also going to be down in the comment sec section, being a part of our partner family. Let's pray now. God, thank you for those who have watched today who you've refreshed and challenged and encouraged. Lord, we lift up the prayer requests. We lift up the gifts, the partners that are even joining right now. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in the earth. You're readying your bride for your coming. You're bringing in a harvest of souls. And Lord, you're touching even the prayer requests being offered right now. We just ask all these things in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you so much.